Hey guys, it's DTakes23, and today Ability Drain Gamer MD83 and I are joined by a very, very special guest, the one and only voice of Scott Ryder, Tom Taylorson. Today we're going to get to know the man behind the voice in anticipation for Mass Effect Andromeda. Thanks again for participating and sending in your questions. Let's get started. We are going to be talking to the amazing Tom Taylorson. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, not that amazing. Just, you know, just a person. <laughs> well, you're amazing <laughs> to us, so there you go. <laughs> That's sweet of you. To, very sweet of you to say. Very sweet of you to say. Thank you. We have, like, an assortment of questions. Yeah, we've got loads of them. That, that's fine. I'll try to, I'll try to be um, as uh, brief as possible so we can get through as much as possible, but... Be warned, I do have a tendency to go on, so I will <laughs> try to, I'll try to rein it in as best I can. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> because he doesn't shut up, is it? Yeah. No, that's, that's good. The more chat we get, the better. Well, I know that pretty much everyone had this question since you're, you know, you're going to be Scott Ryder. Have you ever played any of the Mass Effect games? Yes, I've played through the entire trilogy, uh, DLC and all. Oh, but who did you romance? Uh, <laughs> it's an important question. Liara. And to be very specific, because I think this question was out there somewhere, uh, Fem Shep. Nice. Liara oh. the whole way. Oh, cool. Uh, the biotic, the adept uh, mm -hmm. synthesis ending. Who did you sacrifice? Ashley or Caden? Oh, Caden. <laughs> you sacrificed Caden? Yes, it was a tactical decision. <laughs> yeah. I was, the bi I was the biotic, he was dead weight. So. Oh. <laughs> you monster did you like ashley at all did you like her it was just like uh... it, it, she, she's fine <laughs> I, I don't know yeah it that's just how didn't, i felt too i was it, and it's nothing you know it's nothing about the performance or the character or anything like that anything else like that but i was just doing something it's like well i'm gonna you know let's just let's play as a girl and you know just do just stuff different just to just to do different, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's how it just all played out. Did you play the games before you were in Mass Effect Andromeda? Like oh, yeah. Like, oh, wow. That's cool. Oh, yeah. I played them, I played them as a fan. So I, really cool. I got a 360. It was actually a gift from my family, um, from my parents. Um, and it was pretty much like my only gift that, that, Christmas, that, you know, that Christmas. And I pretty much had it to play uh, Mass Effect. I saw that coming, and a bunch of my friends, we nice. were all PC gamers, and we were kind of transitioning into this because it seemed, that ah, seems pretty cool, and there was like Halo and some other stuff, but we didn't have any games at, at the beginning, and then that thing came out, um, and I had played like all the other Bioware games, mm -hmm. and uh, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to play this one, and I got it, the release weekend, and I remember sitting in the, the condo we were living in, in southern Evanston, just north of Chicago, mm -hmm. um, just playing that thing. Headset on and yep, top to bottom, um, spending way too much time listening to and reading the codex. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, so yeah. you're what like was... a total fan. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. What was your favorite game out of the trilogy? Oh, the first one. Mass the Effect first one. one? Oh. Yes. Um, the look of it, there was nothing out there like it at the time. Um, it felt like a combination of like the original Star Trek with a little Star Wars in there. And then it's almost as though, you know, the J.J. Abrams kind of went back to the original Star Trek series where it's a Western in space. And so it borrowed that. And then it had that, you know, that we're going for this kind of 70s, slightly schlocky, you know, science fiction vibe. And then that soundtrack, you oh, know, a Hewlett soundtrack. and Walls soundtrack, nothing like it. It's yeah. still nothing like it since. The other games got bigger, and it needed a bigger, different sound. But that first one, just those synths and that fake film grain, all of it just kind of came together to make something that I, that sticks with me as, um, as special, as unique, a, a original. Does it feel weird being part of the franchise since you've been playing the games for years, long before you became Ryder? Yes. I mean, there's there's like no follow-up to that. It's simply... <laughs> it's just it's yes. Simply, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it's it's very unusual, and I'm sure that there are people at Bioware that I've been able to work with who want me to shut up because I have thanked them profusely, and I have said, you know, how um, not just as like a, a piece of work, like I because I enjoy work, you know, I enjoy this job, but this particular thing is uh, special because these are people, whether they're some of the writers um, or the directors and people like that, these are people whose work I've enjoyed and admired. And then to be able to work with them on something like this, 
it's a it's a privilege. This is not something that was ever, definitely not in the realm of you know uh, reality when I was back working in Chicago, mm-hmm. and that's um, you know being out here in in California, Los Angeles was not a thing during Mass Effect one or two or three. You know, mm-hmm. this was a relatively recent move, so even the opportunity. I had auditioned for um, for Mass Effect 3, you know, years and years ago. But it was a long shot. I knew that wasn't going to happen, but you do it anyways. And so these kinds of things and this kind of experience was never in the realm of possibility. And then even after moving here, even, you know, knowing that this kind of stuff happens out here, this work happens out here, I still didn't think <laughs> it was in the <laughs> yeah. realm of possibility. So um, it's, been a, it's, been, it's been a blast for a variety of reasons. Did you have any expectation coming into this franchise or was it just like an easy transition or it was just totally overwhelming? All of those things. I mean, I expected something of myself. You know, I wanted to make sure that I came in prepared and you know, gave everything that I possibly could. And I wasn't sure what to expect from the job itself. And so it was a little intimidating, but everybody has been so wonderful top to bottom. And as much as I wound up questioning me, really? You guys sure? You pause, <laughs> right? Like thus far, I'm known for making octopus sounds. You know this, right? <laughs> um, you know, and commercials and audiobooks. Well, relatively early on, within the first few months and the first few sessions, I found that the work, and again, this is a testament to the writers and the directors that we that we work with at Bioware, um, both in person and over uh, Skype, of all things. Um, <laughs> the work became easy or just easier. The performances became, it just clicked more easily and quickly than I thought it would. And I think some of that speaks to everything that everybody else has built. And then to maybe a certain extent casting, you know, it it took a while and and you, but you kind of go, maybe I am supposed to be here doing this. You know, this is not coming easily, but naturally, you know, and these choices are coming naturally. And yeah, this is this is a pretty good fit. OK. Mm-hmm. And then you finally see it up there on screen. You know, the voice in this character that I never got to see until you guys saw it. <laughs> and and then still kind of going, I guess it works. <laughs> sort of, you know, that, that that little bit of doubt is always with me. Yeah, probably because it's such a because you're such a big fan and it's just such a big role that you're just like I can't it's I I can imagine it's still very surreal it's just I love seeing that I love when because we don't see that too often where a huge fan of a franchise goes in to be one of the Mm -hmm. voice actors but Mm -hmm. it's so cool to 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 know that because I I didn't know that about you so it's it's just it's very heartwarming to know that 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 you brought that (laughs) along with with uh to to Scott you know it's 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 awesome yeah and then put it in a box (laughs) <laughs> and then I take it all and I put it in a little box because you've got to show up and go to work, you know, yeah. um, in working with, uh, Caroline Livingstone, who's a voice director extraordinaire up there when the first, uh, first few sessions, she was about to explain something to me. And I said, uh, oh, yeah, the Turians, she had a kind of moment of, you have to, I said, all right, before we go any further, uh, Caroline, I've played all of them top to bottom, <laughs> you know, listen to the code, all this, other stuff like that. and she went, oh, okay. <laughs> Hey, good to know. And then the following week, she went to explain something, and she went, "Oh, right, it's you. You, you know all this, okay?" And we moved on. And so it was. It was kind of neat to have a little bit of a shorthand. Mm-hmm. You know, when she they describe something, I know exactly what they're talking about oh, or a moment. I guess it must give you an edge when recording your lines. To an extent, but at the end of the day, you got to show up and act. You know, mm-hmm. so while they might be able to speak to me in shorthand that they may not be able to in references, they may not be able to use with another actor. You can still translate that and change that, you know. They still say me, say to me, you know, a Krogan approaches, and I know exactly what that means. Mm-hmm. And for somebody else, they just say the biggest dude you've ever seen, <laughs> right? with with a chip on his shoulder, approaches. That same idea, whatever it is in your head to get that performance out. Mm-hmm. Um, they just have a way of being able to speak within uh, the lore with me that mm-hmm. you know, may not be accessible to somebody else. Uh, but you'll see there are people in this game that aren't fans or, you know, video game, excuse me, video game players. And, and they're absolutely wonderful. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's it, it's yes, it can seem like an edge. Uh, but at the same time, it's not necessary. So we have a fan question 
from uh, Natalie Gallet. She says, what has your experience been so far in terms of being welcomed by the Mass Effect community? Oh, it's like being here on this podcast with you right now. Um, mm-hmm. Wonderful. Everybody's been very supportive and open, uh, even as I made the joke of everybody else being celebrated and look at all these wonderful people and who's this guy but it's true i you know i get that uh and that's fine that's and that's been kind of fun but everybody's been very warm and welcoming and i still laugh to myself when i (laughs) as these as this you know these followers things like that come i laugh because i realize you know you haven't heard anything yet i might not even be good i might not even be any good at this you may not like my stuff but here you are anyway i appreciate it thank you (laughs) um so and i know that just comes with mass effect it's like you know oh this is somebody and something associated with this and somebody we're gonna follow you know these performances are important to us oh look you know glom onto it as as, especially as we're all kind of just desperate for information about the game um and the world so i get that um but the the community has been wonderful absolutely uh wonderful and uh i know it's not always the case with fan communities <laughs> <laughs> online uh so it's it's really neat i think the mass effect the community that bioware has made simply by virtue of what they put into the games um and uh socially the writing the characters things like that that they build uh and then the community they built around the people that glommed on to those games those experiences um is wonderful and diverse and positive. And I think that lends itself to, well, to you guys. And, well, you know, of course that reception is going to be great because every time I turn around, somebody's talking about some experience. You know, I was in the middle of this when Mass Effect came around. Yeah. Or, you know, there was a divorce or a loss yeah. in the family, something like that. And Mass Effect, I glommed onto it. I glommed onto these characters, these relationships, the, the, the these events, this world. And it, kind of help me through that. Mm -hmm. And that's important. You know, that's special. Yeah. I think it still serves as, even though, you know, the game is older now, it still serves as that for a lot of us. Yeah. And, and then there'll be, there'll be a whole new, in theory, you know, a whole new generation of people, uh, really getting into mass effect for the first time. You know, this may be their, first. they may have watched videos of the other ones, things like that may be aware of it, but this may be the first time they sit down and, pick up the controller and really play through a Mass Effect game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's that's going to be something else too. So here's a question from Matthew Carlisle who asks, what's Octodad up to these days? Oh, just relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> Poolside, right? Raising kids. <laughs> just doing his nine to five best he can. You know, the job simulator, it's like that, right? You know, <laughs> knocking things over. <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> waiting to play Mass Effect Andromeda <laughs> poorly, right? I'm sure somebody will bring up uh, Octodad again at some point. But uh, <laughs> talk about special games. Um, that is a special one, very, very special game uh, to me, and of course to the young horses, the guys who made it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It just a treat to work on the game and to work with them, and then to see what they did with that game and what it became and meant for them as a young, young team and a young studio. Unbelievable, unbelievable stuff. So a privilege to be a part of that. What was the first game you ever played? First game I ever played? Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I because it would be, I would have been You're four, really young. Yeah. four or five oh, wow. with, an, with an Intellivision. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> my, my, dad's, my dad's an engineer. And so every now and then dad comes home with toys. Um, <laughs> that changed as he got a little bit changed a little bit as he got older. Um, but so there was this in television in the house and he would buy stuff and new stuff for it. And I would play it. And then my brother would play it when it came along. Um, but then of course, by, was it 87 or something like that? When we got it, um, we got the, it was for my brother's birthday, I think the, the NES advantage or the next, uh, the one that came with the, the light gun. So you had the dual mm-hmm. copy of uh, the the dual copy that was uh, Super Mario and Duck Hunt. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Duck Hunt <laughs> was my first. One. Yeah, 
<laughs> so you had that, and then we had Top Gun, and all the, just all the games that came with that, and then the Super Nintendo, and then you know it just kept going, and then somewhere during Super Nintendo, late Nintendo, because of friends and things, I got into PC gaming, and so I was upgrading my computer and begging for pieces and parts so I could play the next Wing Commander and things like that, and I was building oh, my cool. own rigs and changing things out and playing the Lucas Arts Adventures and Sierra games and the Tie Fighter and X Wing series and. Oh. Oh, that stuff yeah um secret weapons of the luftwaffe i loved uh, <laughs> lucas arts loved lucas arts stuff nice. um yeah so it's been my entire life um has been you know games and video games and while there's a lots of important stuff you know i went up i became a, an actor for a vari- variety of reasons what's i never became i suppose i could have but i never became you know a coder or graphic designer things like that it just wasn't a part of uh, things and so to have the opportunity to play with and contribute to an industry that is so important to me, mm-hmm. you know, in my own way, because even though I didn't do those other things that you typically think of as being necessary to help make a game, um, I still get to help. And yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's amazing to be able to have that little piece, that little part, you know, on and off for a while. It's great. You mentioned um, that you wanted to be an actor, I'm guessing, early when you were pretty young? I, I think I kind of called it in eighth grade. Oh, nice. And yeah. was it like, uh, did you did you already know about the, because I know a lot of actors go into acting um, and not really thinking about voice acting, but more of like mm-hmm. actual performance. Was it mm-hmm. Was voice acting something that you always wanted to do or was it always the performance and then the voice acting came later? The voice acting came later, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized it's been something in the back of my head all along, whether I realized it was like a career opportunity or not. I've always been playing with my voice. I always sang, um, doing silly impressions, voices to make my, like my, make my dad laugh. Mm -hmm. And then I remember, um, and then I remember recording, uh, afternoon cartoons, uh, specifically, um, I would record uh, Animaniacs and uh, <laughs> and and uh, uh, and the uh, uh, Tiny Toons, oh. and then of course Batman animated series. Oh. And I would pause it on VHS. I would pause it and read the credits. Oh, you know wow. when the credits were still when the credits were still full screen yeah, at mm-hmm. the end of a show, right? And you could actually do yeah. that and read them. Yeah. Um, and I would read through the credits, and I remember just remembering some of those names being repeated over and over again, like seeing Rob Paulson all the time and some of these things. And then, you know, watching Batman going, wait, Mark Hamill? Like, Mark <laughs> Hamill? Mark Hamill? You know, it's like, that's brilliant. And then, of course, he pops up in the LucasArts games, in Full Throttle and things mm-hmm. like that. You know, and he's brilliant. Yeah. He's, God, he's brilliant. <laughs> so I started following these names, you know, Maurice LaMarche, Rob Paulson, uh, Kath Susie, and just... Uh, Debbie Derryberry and and just these different names, <laughs> so following cool. them percolating up in the back of my head as I'm going and studying Chekhov and Meisner <laughs> technique and uh, and Shakespeare things like that. So it was in the back of my head. You know that was you know mm-hmm. a long time. That was a while ago. But then when opportunities uh, popped up and I started doing this voiceover thing, and it became my full time job. I had that realization of. Oh, I'm supposed <laughs> to be doing this. This is what it was. <laughs> but I think, you know, you guys being a little younger, it, you're here talking to me. That speaks to what voice acting has become within, I think, just the last 10 years. Yeah. Uh, people are much more aware of it as a vocation and those performers and those performances. Yeah. Uh, and part of it is because of the Internet, you know, Internet movie database and things like <clears> that. <throat> you can look up these things about these people. And then with Twitter, and whatnot, you can reach out and touch them, you know, and, and be in touch with them. So it's much more front and center as something that is a way for a performer to expand their skill set. Mm-hmm. Another way to work as a performer and make a couple bucks, you know, making it your full-time thing. That's a big, you know, that's a big leap. That's a big thing. But in Chicago, it's part of what you did and what you do because you just got to do everything you can. There's only so many opportunities in Chicago to work as an actor. So you do every single one of them in order to make ends meet or not as the case may be. Did you have a backup plan just in case? 
No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Theater arts, theater arts BFA, no minor. This was it. Yeah, I mean, I could have studied other things. You know, I got good grades. I did the good student thing. Um, but it was, um, it was just what I wanted to do. That was it. And I just enjoyed it. It was one of the few things. And as I've learned more about myself and about my psyche, um, it was, I realized it was one of the things that kind of quieted my mind because there was mm-hmm. so much going on at any given moment yeah. that it was, it gave me a singular focus. And those times and those moments where I'm working is it just, it's, um, satisfying and fulfilling in a way that other work hasn't been and so that's very satisfying and i think the wonderful thing about voiceover for me is that um my mother was is a language arts teacher my father's an engineer so voiceover is kind of a combination of that it's reading out loud right you know it's this Mm -hmm. performing art it's this acting combined with science you know playing with the microphone getting things to time match you know there's there's both things happening at all times with this that's and cool. that is, yeah. And I realized, oh, that also plays into it because I may think of things, oh, it's performer kind of loosey goosey, but I also approach things very scientifically too. Mm-hmm. That's, That's really inspiring. Not a lot of people have that, uh, you know, gusto to, you know, yeah. just go out and go out there and do what they want to do. Yeah, uh, you know, I have, help. <laughs> what? I, I, have a- I have very forgiving <laughs> parents, um, very helpful parents, you know, um, oh, and good. some of that help, you know goes on, you know, beyond college, you know, whether it's, you know, personally, financially, things like that, you know, my, my family has always been there and very, very supportive. Um, and I cannot thank them, uh, enough for that. That's, uh, that was a huge component of it. Um, because there were plenty of tough times, you know, and even after I was working and it's going, there's tough times while you're doing it. It may seem like, oh, you're working. It's like, right, but <laughs> now I'm married and now there's a house. Now there are mm-hmm. kids, you know, and dogs and things. And so those tough times continue. you got to find different ways of, of keeping going. I guess in my experience, voiceover work can be very sporadic. Sometimes there's nothing at all and other times there's an influx. Yes. Actually, that leads on really nicely to another question we have here. It's something you did answer on Twitter, but not everybody follows us on there. So, do you have any advice for anyone that wants to get into voice acting? Go to FridaWolf.com. <laughs> <laughs> Go to her nice. blog section. And uh, <laughs> she had a great missive because she had gotten the question often enough. And she just copied and pasted websites and resources there. Um, and then within that blog section, she also wrote her own little story uh, of recommendations of how to kind of jumpstart it. Um, and a great thing between with Frida myself. And I think it, I think it comes through in the game a little bit, um, is our different backgrounds. I've got the BFA in theater, classically trained, blah, blah. I did Shakespeare, you know, all of this stuff. And Frida was in game development in audio. And then she, well, she can tell you the story, but she learned acting through classes and improv and things like that out here Mm -hmm. to kind of ramp up and get in the box. So, Two very different approaches still get the right performance, you know. Yes. And so it doesn't need to be, you know, Meisner technique. You don't need to read all of, you know, Michael Chekhov and Stanislavski and Boleslavski and all that stuff. You know, there are classes offered at uh, Second City and Upright Citizens Brigade and uh, Improv Olympic and comedy sports, things like that, is it's about relating to an audience. It's about connecting to an audience. And it doesn't matter if they're right in front of you or on the other side of a camera lens or on the other side of a speaker. Yeah. Uh, so that's that. It's, it, it's, it's acting. It's all acting. Um, and then the other, the other place I would plug is uh, run by D. Bradley Baker. And his, his site is simply I want to be a voice actor dot com. Uh, <laughs> D had enough questions that he just wrote a few t- few good missives mm-hmm. about performing and acting and voice acting and what kind of equipment and things like that you might want because uh, the as you guys are very well aware with your home equipment right there um, this kind of thing is much more accessible more so than it has ever been it, you know in the history of recorded audio so it's about what you put into it. And I think with the proliferation of, you know, online voiceover sites and things like that, um, the, if you got it, you 
to compete, you got to be really good. And I think that competition, uh, that competitive edge, I should say, comes from acting and the ability mm-hmm. to perform yeah. and connect with an audience. What was your first voice acting gig? I'm pretty sure of this because I don't think so. It was, <laughs> it was the first it was the first thing I, I auditioned for with an agency who shall remain nameless. <laughs> they don't they don't exist anymore. It was it was bad. It was rough. <laughs> but it was a video game called Dao Fang the Fist of Lotus. Ooh. And it, and, <laughs> and it, was, it was for the original, you know, um through the original Xbox. Oh nice. Um, oh. And it was directed and whatnot by John Tobias, who is half of John Tobias and Ed Boon, the creators of Mortal Kombat. Oh wow. Oh, wow. Oh. Yeah, so I came in to do two parts for that, and they liked me enough, and it went smoothly enough that they called me back to do like three or four more parts for the game. Cool. Um, yeah, and it was great, just a great um, jumping off point. And that was my first audition. Again, right? Hey, hey, you should probably do this, kid. Hey, you should probably <laughs> do this, kid. No, I'm going to do this other thing and whatnot, you know. <laughs> and af- after that, it would be, you know, a few more years before I got a proper demo and upgraded agents and things like that. Um, yeah. So the uh, first thing I did was a video game of all things. Nice. So, That's uh, awesome. Oh, it's yeah. Great. And it was great fun. <laughs> it's great fun to work on. There's videos of, of the roles I played and things like that's out there somewhere. Um, and then uh, a friend of mine at the time was also in the game. She was doing like the, the announcer and another character in it. It was it was it was really awesome to have awesome. something like that in Chicago. You know, I was like, wow, this is a major game in Chicago. Isn't this stuff done elsewhere? <laughs> no, John insisted doing it there, and he was wonderful to work with. And then I was fortunate enough years later to work uh, on Mortal Kombat Armageddon with Ed Boon. So, nice. yeah, crazy stuff. It was very very cool. Very very cool as somebody who grew up on Mortal Kombat. Very cool. What did, what did you do on on Mortal Kombat? Uh, Mortal Kombat. Uh, this was Mortal Kombat Armageddon, so it had the. Um, the uh, story mode. Mm-hmm, I remember. Uh, Dagon. Oh my god, that was you. Yeah, and I was twenty whatever, playing the older brother. Right, playing the older brother to an actor who was probably like five or six years older than I was. Um, <laughs> and that that game was a, that was a game was a uh, that was a treat to work on. Um, I can imagine. Yeah, because it was just it was one day, one session. We cranked out everything with Dagon, and then you get to that to the fighting sounds. And there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. They brought in a separate gentleman, I forget his name, and I wish I remembered it, to do the fighting sounds with you. And he just pulled you through it just by force of will, you know? Uh-huh. We're going to do this. Okay, we're going to do this. And we're going to do this. Yeah, great. Give me three of these. Oh, boom, boom. He's okay, I'm gonna play the, okay, I'm going to play the, the, uh, the fatality here. Okay. Yeah, so you get hit up in the air and you fall for 10 seconds and you land on the spikes. Now, we got the sound of you getting hit. We got the sound of you hitting the spikes. I just need you to, to give me a 10 second long banger scream as you fall. Go. <laughs> and you scream <laughs> and you scream for 10 seconds and then he says all right yeah that was awesome one more <laughs> and you scream for 10 seconds i bet that's exhausting after exerting yourself like that it was but i think and it happens and it still happens today it's it's a, it's an hour after the session when i realize how tired i am and now that nowadays that I'm older, maybe a half hour, but <laughs> it was it was just energizing and awesome and full body and full mind, kind of full contact. And so some of that, um, you know, if it's a longer day, you got to pace yourself a little more. But some of that stuff was you know, reminded me of the theater days where the curtain comes down at 10, 30, 11 o'clock and you're still up till 12, 1230 because just that experience, that adrenaline and just. Feeling is wonderful. And, you know, maybe if I'd stuck it out and done more theater for longer and some of the veterans would say, no, no, it tapers off. You, your body gets used to it. And you get used to it and it becomes more job like. Um, mm-hmm. I never quite hit that in my in my <clears throat> like, 10 years in, in the Chicago theater scene. You have a an extensive workload. I mean, you've worked with TV and film, radio, audiobooks, gaming. Which no. one do you prefer? Um, or is it all the same thing, basically? No, it's not all the same thing. Um, you know, audiobooks are like the marathon of of voiceover. Um, and video games have that, too. I'm biased because Andromeda has been so special. And I've recorded a couple other things in the past few months that are also very special that I cannot discuss, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think, and maybe it's just my background, um, and I haven't had much 
uh, work animation yet. <laughs> but um, is that a hint? Was that a hint? Yes. No, it's not yes. a hint. It is a. It is a. That's not a hint. That's a. That's a promise. Is what that is. Um, nice. But I. Um, I really love the video game stuff. I just do. The people that yeah. I've that I've had the opportunity to work with, um, and the projects and and the variety. Because you go in and yes, there's dialogue and. Suddenly you're, you're talking to somebody, then you're making a purchase, and then you're killing them, and then you're dodging, and then you're dying, and then you're screaming and bleeding, and then now it's, okay, now I need cold breathing, okay, now I need hot breathing, and, and now my- And sexy I'm, time. Yeah, and then sex, I need sexy time breathing, and then I need poison breathing. This is a thing. And I need like 30 seconds of you breathing as though you're poisoned, and you just look on the other side of the glass and go, What? Not, yeah, I totally okay. know how to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, and I think that, again, speaks to my own kind of um, internal distractions and keeping that and keeping my head in the game. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think video games are my favorite. No one sell to any of the other stuff. You know, I spent a long time doing mostly uh, uh, commercials and things like that, but video games are just too darn <laughs> That actually leads nicely on to a question from Sleeping X BRB, who asks, how awkward was it to record the sexy time romance scenes? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? Not that awkward. Like the scenes are well written and they play and they play out very well. Um, and, you know, it says right there, the parenthetical of flirt. It's like, OK, you do that. Um, and you just go. And then you do different versions of it. And then you go through and you have your moment and there's kissing and you record the kissing separately. Uh, <laughs> and then you go back and you turn that person down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, Fire yeah. You, oh, yeah, yeah. You do all of these different options. You mm -hmm. shut them down. Or you get so far and somebody will say, oh, I don't swing that way. And you go, <laughs> oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And so you get all of those options, and that's kind of fun too, because you think, "Oh, what a sweet scene, whatever." And then you go, "Okay, back." And now then you, you record the sound of the heartbreaking. And it speaks to, I think, it speaks to the um, the writing and the quality thereof, uh, the what they write as well as the characters they write. That when you're in that situation, you read, "Okay, now you're going to break their heart or shut them down or whatever it is." Like I, as the actor, go, "Uh huh." Uh huh. <laughs> Oh, or, oh, I'm awful. <laughs> you know, I'm an awful person. Oh, my goodness. Um, so uh, that's not too awkward. It is the, it is the okay, here's the scene. We've got it animated, and I need to make kissing noises and heavy breathing, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> that can be um, awkward. But it's it's part of the thing. You know, I would always, somebody asked something like that, and I said, okay, imagine being on a film set. Mm -hmm. and it's, yeah. <laughs> sometimes they shut, they'll shut it down, right? They keep only... For certain sequences, you know, they'll keep only a handful of people that are necessary to be there in that yeah. space. So but it's not too weird. Right, right. And but you show up and you go to work and you compartmentalize or whatever else it is, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a lot of this. It's it winds up being as much as you try to kind of get into it and convey all of the thoughts and feelings and emotions of the situation, it winds up being very technical. Um, you're matching to time and how things go and how much do they need and they'll be able to edit this out. So that kind of gets in the way of it being too much one way and too awkward the other. <laughs> so there's a question, I guess, goes with the sexy time as well from Headless Krogan. Are you ready for the, <laughs> Are you ready for the deluge of writer erotic fan art that will inevitably be made? <laughs> That's as fine. I, You're like totally. Uh, uh, you know, the funny thing about that is, and I will say this until somebody tells me to stop, and even then I'll continue to say it. You know, I am, um, I am the voice of Scott Ryder, um, and I'm very particular about that because I just like off the top of my head, there's probably 30 people, and this doesn't include the people that make the variety of, you know, textures and other things that go on the Scott Ryder polygons. Uh, but 30 people that make the Scott Ryder performance between teams of writers, four different directors, animators, modelers, two to three different performance capture actors whose work I borrow from and then dub over, things like that. So like 20 to 30 people make that performance happen. Mm 
So if somebody's going to take that image and that idea and make some slash fic about it, that's okay. (laughs) You know, that's because I've got my voice. I still I get to have this. Um, I think it would be harder or more difficult if I would, you know, I can only imagine like what Daniel Radcliffe goes through every day. You're Daniel Radcliffe. But if we put you in this outfit and take a picture of you, that image of you is no longer you. And you don't get to have that image of yourself anymore. That is now this character. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? And I can imagine that the Star Wars cast, you know, having that. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not. That's not you. That's not you, Mr. Boyega. That is now Finn. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, and so there's a little bit of that with this. But because of that, uh, in a sense, disconnect between that image and idea and what I get to bring, the, the more limited creative element that I bring to it, it's not as awkward. Yeah. And so I get to have a little little corner. Oh, it's just the voice. It's just the voice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I um, you've mentioned Star Wars a few times, so I, we've got to ask, or at least Jamal Jackson asks as well. But I, I, I think this is a really good question. <laughs> if you could choose between biotics or the Force, which would you choose? Ooh, I got to go with the Force. Mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a fan of... Um, um, Eastern philosophy and Buddhism, things like that. And that little piece of that always kind of appealed to me. Yeah. So, yep. Got to go with the force. I love science, but I got to go with the force. Yep. Every, a lot of people had this question about you and Frida. Since you yes. worked together on Octodad, mm-hmm. when you guys found out, did you already, like, did you know initially that you were both auditioning for Mass Effect Andromeda? Or did you find out afterwards, after you were cast? Oh, it was afterwards. Um, oh, wow. Now, now, now Frida will get to tell her, tell her version of the story. And uh, I'm happy to tell the story again because it is, it's a heck of a story. Um, I auditioned for it a while back, at, like the summer, summer of 2015, something like that. Mm-hmm. And it goes into the wilderness and it's gone. So then I get a call saying, hey, I think we got a bite. Give me a call back. And I said, okay. And he told me what it was and you know, talked about my availability. I said, fine. And then um, a little while later, I get an email confirming the booking. Uh, it was my birthday that year. <laughs> and a week or so later, I'm in a booth in West L.A. and doing this thing and patched into Caroline Livingstone and working with her. So I had a couple of sessions in. And it was sometime in September, I want to say about a month after I had done eh, like one session, two sessions after I had the gig. Uh, Frida and I were talking on the phone. Uh, she was stuck in, she was stuck in traffic, long way home. And uh, we'd been kind of checking in because I'd only been in town at that point for three months. I had just moved out here. And so we're talking and she says, yeah, I'm doing this. We're trying to figure out if we can meet up, maybe have some lunch. And she says, oh, yeah, I can't, I'm, you know, I, I just came in off of a, a session uh, down at the, in this particular studio. And I said, I'm at that particular studio tomorrow. <laughs> huh. And Frida says, okay, since we both have an NDA in place, let's play the, are we on the same game game? Okay. <laughs> um, is your game a long running sci-fi franchi- franchise in space? Ah, uh, yes. Yes, it is. And I said, okay, my turn. Uh, is your game being, is your game being directed from Canada? And she says, yes. And we go, okay, we're working on the same game. We're in the same game. Cool. Cool. <laughs> we drop it for about eh, 15 minutes. Talk about other things. And then she just stops and goes, okay, okay, okay. No, no, no. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. Can you keep a secret? Can you keep a secret? <laughs> sure, Frida, I, I can keep a secret. I am the female player character in the next Mass Effect game. <laughs> <laughs> and I let it sit for about a second and I said well Frida um, can you keep a secret because I'm the male player character in the next Mass Effect game and then it's wow. about 15 minutes of shut up shut up <laughs> and so sitting on this for a year with not being able to tell the young horses the guys who made Octodad um, or anything else, you know, we had like a code name for the game when we were discussing it, things like that. Um, so it was a heck of a new piece of news to sit on for so long. 
but it was great. It was like our little thing, and we could check in every now and then. And now Frida's got a you know much more extensive resume, and she's still working hard every day. And I, I love her work. So you know, I would check in. It's like I'm doing this again. I don't have anything else going on. <laughs> I just wanted to say that I'm you know, I'm working again. Yay! Um, otherwise, I'm here. I'm, I'll be here at home. You know, recording audiobooks. <laughs> and so every now and then we'd see each other in passing. I'd be coming in and she'd be coming out. Uh, they try to schedule us on the same days. So that there's that continuity for the directors. You know, um, mm-hmm. maybe there was something that came up with one of our sessions that's good information to have for the next one. Uh, things like that. Or, you know, Frida did it this way. I think this works. Uh, and it just for convenience's sake and for the mental health of the directors and the engineer. So, yes, we sat on that for about a year. Um before it was announced on N7 Day. Awesome. Uh, and yeah, yeah, and it was crazy because I knew her only from Octodad. We hadn't really worked together. You know, that was all done in Chicago and she was out here in California. Um, but we were friends kind of over the internet. And when I started making inroads to moving to California, uh, she was like the only person I saw and hung out with. So I, you know, I talked her ear off about certain mm-hmm. things and I asked her questions about other things. And so, yeah, we've been friends for a little bit. And have that Octodad mm-hmm. thing. And then to have this happen, um, yeah, unbelievable. Oh, now you're brother and sister. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's yeah. so good. Yeah, the father and daughter and all the other people. Uh, so the the wife, Scarlett, and the little boy, both played by uh, Anne Sonneville, another good friend of mine, and a phenomenal actress and voice actress. Um, and then Frida is the daughter. I am Octodad, and then all the other men. And then Frida is all the other women in the game. <laughs> so so cool. I do Octodad and the random background guys and the, the scientists and Sushi Chef and things like that. <laughs> and, Frida, and Frida does all the other stuff. Yeah. It's only three of us on that thing. It was, it was, it was a blast. Wow. How does it feel to have Mr. Krabs, SpongeBob SquarePants, <laughs> as your father? That's a question from Icewire. Amazing, right? <laughs> right? 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 Um, well, there's always this um, kind of a bit, and it's kind of an obvious obvious thing, you know, that you know, you've got a father figure. He's N7, right? And all this other stuff, and we're traveling with dad, and you, you look up to dad, you know, and that kind of thing, and the responsibility. And suddenly you're there, and you've got to assume responsibility, you know, as part of the mission, and having, you know, dad to look up to, right? There's always that thing. It's kind of a historical thing. And then finally they drop who dad is. And I go, well, yeah, now I've got inferiority <laughs> complex. Sheesh, you know, I've been, I've, I've been watching Mr. Brown for a long time, you know, on, yeah. you know, on camera, everything else he does and his voice acting. And of course, Lex Luthor through the Justice League thing. Oh, go, oh my gosh, he's, he's wonderful. Um, and I had the, uh, had the opportunity uh, last week while we were working on some other things. He was on his way out as we were on our way in. And he oh. was just a wonderful gentleman. And we just kind of said hi and. He's, yep, just a class act and just a really awesome guy. And I'm still, you know, like I said, I'm still kind of green. I still feel very green out of Chicago. So there's a little bit of, this is where I go up and I take a selfie with him, right? No. no <laughs> and then no, you go you inside sit. and scream to yourself. like <laughs> Right. No, you sit down and you talk to him because he's just a nice guy, you know, doing his job too. And yeah. Yeah. You fangirl in, 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 in private. The only problem is that now I know that he voiced Mr. Krabs, I want him to talk like that through the entire game. He's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Um, and there are bits and pieces of my performance that I will hear as we go back and fix some stuff. And I hear him and I go, ooh, can I do this differently? Because he sounds so good. You know? <laughs> I just want to tweak my work to match with that. Do they let you do that? Do a retake if you're not entirely happy after hearing the other voice actor respond to you? Well, that's not up to me. There are, there are teams of quality assurance people and the directors and everybody up there listening to every single piece of dialogue in context. And they kind of have like a metric and say, is it within this parameter? You know, is somebody shouting in an intimate sequence? Okay. And we have to go back and fix it. Um, And I think too, the same thing happens where they will go, is it okay? Or can we switch it? Can we fix this? Because is this person available? Can we get them back? I don't know. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times there will be stuff that uh, Frida and I will fix because we're going to be back. And so we're learning kind of that process right now is that, Oh, this changed and this changed. Well, we can't change this actor, so we're going to change you mm-hmm. because you're here. Right. You're the player character. It's your job to adapt to all these different things. So, yeah, I'm always going to be hard on myself. 
mm-hmm. period. That's just my nature. So um, I will hear things and I go, nope, that's not it. No, no. And my director and engineer, they'll say, e- we got to move on. It sounds fine. And I go, no, I'm going to play the game. <laughs> I'm going to flip and I'm going to go, that's the one you chose? That's the wrong take. No, I, there's a better take. There's different music in that take. I can, uh. I'm going to flip. So I have to, so I have to like really uh, relax and kind of just let the process be itself and trust that there are other people, you know, saying, yeah, this works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This, this, this works. This will be okay. And it's not that I don't trust those people. It's just my own nature to, as having been a teacher of this work, you know, um, that kind of director mentality going, Ooh, that doesn't stitch the way I would want it to, or just hearing that everything come together and realizing that's okay. But, Oh, there's another version of that that would be even stronger or different or whatever that would make me happier. Mm-hmm. And I got to let that go. I have to ask because I, I'm a huge fan of theater and Shakespeare and you've mentioned Shakespeare. I don't know about you ladies, but I have to ask, have you ever been in any Shakespeare plays? Oh Yeah. Oh my God! Who? What, which ones? Um, uh, like small parts in big shows and big parts in small shows, um, back and forth. So I've done. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> of course, like Midsummer Night's Dream, Romeo and Juliet, uh-huh. uh, Caesar, uh-huh. Macbeth, um, Taming of the Shrew, oh. Two Noble Kinsmen. Uh-huh. Um, and of course, I've read and studied like all of them, I'm trying to think of anything I missed. I spent, as an understudy and then an internal understudy and all sorts of stuff, I spent years working in and out and around of, uh, Chicago Shakespeare. Oh, that's cool. And so And so I, I learned a lot and gleaned a lot from them. And then I'm going to plug the heck out of a couple friends of mine, uh, Jan and David Blixt, mm-hmm. uh, who now run uh, the Michigan Shakespeare uh, uh uh, festival and company up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they, years ago, it started in Chicago, the, uh, a, uh, a crew of patches and they still run it as part of Michigan Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was a small team of, I forget how many actors we memorized big and small roles mm-hmm. of full two hour length Shakespeare productions, wow. um, in rep. So we all had various sized roles and fights and things like that in our head for five different Shakespeare shows ready to go at any given moment. Oh my God. And so we, we, and then they shopped it out to student groups and they said, you give us two hours, we'll give you a full Shakespeare show. And they were just broken down, like very, very little anything. We were trying to kind of recreate what it might've been like, uh, using this small company. And some of the best Shakespeare work and Jan and David as directors and showrunners for those things were phenomenal the people that i worked with were excellent and it was just an absolute theater and shakespeare boot camp oh, you know that's so um, cool no time to you know to grouse and really pour over things you just had to know the script you had to know you had to know how to scan it and get it up on its feet asap wow. because while you were tranio in taming of the shrew mm-hmm. you were also Mercutio in this and oh by the way you're also you're also performing in Macbeth and everybody in Macbeth has to learn how to fight because there are three (laughs) to four fight sequences so Mm -hmm. the men and women were fight yeah and so you had like three three fights in your head some of us had two had to fight both sides of the fight in your head at any given time um and it was it was a treat it was an absolute blast. And those people, I will never forget those people and those experiences and when it went absolutely right and when it went absolutely wrong. Um, so that was definitely a Shakespeare boot camp. Um, um, and it was a heck of an experience. And Jan and David are wonderful. And, and David's an author as well. And just, I can't thank them enough for having me uh, uh, along for the ride for the, for the relatively brief amount of time that I was there with them. Did you have any mentors or anyone that you looked up to in the industry? Mentors, it was mostly, you know, uh, instructors from university. Uh, I went to Illinois Wesleyan University in uh, Bloomington, Illinois. And um, Dr. John Ficka was uh, the uh, master Ficka, some of us called him. He, uh, uh, I learned a lot from him and he took a lot of chances with me. Uh, Gene Kerr, uh, who was a dance and movement instructor there. 
they tried to get me dancing. It didn't work. And then she said, all right. <laughs> and she said, all right, if you're not going to do this, then I'm going to put a sword in your hand. And so Ooh, she taught like, me awesome. movement and combat. Yep. And I was a teacher's aide and a demo dummy for combat classes. And she got me into that. And that, which then transitions later on into working on, uh, transitions into working in Shakespeare a bunch. Um, so those people were very, very important. Uh, but, you know, people that I look up to, this the kind of usual icons in the industry and people like that, um, uh, voice actor wise, I suppose, since we're talking about that primarily, um, a lot of names that I, uh, people that I look up to, people uh, whose work I love, uh, one of the names I love, and it's not really a surprise uh, in some ways, just because of how he's known in the industry, things like that, but Bob Bergen. Bob is kind of put out there and known like, oh, he's the voice, he's, he's the voice of Porky Pig. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> but look at, look at any, most any like animated movie in the past, however many years. And that also with, or extra voices or whatever, mm -hmm. Bob's in there. And that means something. Mm -hmm. There's trust. There's a lot of things. And you'll see a lot of other names in there, like Tara Strong and a bunch of others mm -hmm. that we need to fill in some stuff. Who can give me three to five varied performances and fit in and do this stuff? Up, oh, Bob. Up, oh, Tara. Nice. You know? And that's what makes a career. Mm -hmm. You know, if you come in and you have just the right voice, you sound special or something like that, great. You've got that job or that something or other. But do you have the, you know, uh, the versatility and the everything else that goes along with it to come in and consistently deliver something, maybe not like the star turning performance, but you show up and you go to work and everybody likes working with you and you are trusted and mm -hmm. you just do good work. You are so good that they can't ignore you. Yeah. That's Bob. That's nice. Bob on a daily basis, you know? Wow. And so as much as I plug some people's work to my students, you know, like Matt Mercer and people like that, mm -hmm. um, Travis Willingham. I mean, these are people who are my age, you know. Um, I I always look at Bob and I go, yeah, that's what you want. That's the career, you know. Uh, D. Bradley Baker. Now, he's special <laughs> in a variety <laughs> of ways. But he also, uh, we need some background. Boom. Bring me, give me D. Because I know he's he's already in the building and he does good work. Um, one of the fun things I noticed uh, early on in the uh, cartoon Star Wars Rebels, mm -hmm. the main cast... All wonderful people. Yeah. Um, but then when you look at it, it's breaks. It's, you know, it's Freddie Prince Jr. And Vanessa Marshall and things like that. And then suddenly you will notice that uh, uh, you'll notice that Steve Bloom plays his character. And then like three others. And all Storm the stormtroopers. <laughs> right. Stormtrooper number five. Things yeah, like that. Yeah. Why? <laughs> because we already have Steve here. And the contract says we get you for three voices before we pay you more. And it's not that they don't trust those other people to deliver those other performances, but S Steve's been there and done that before. Yeah. Yeah. And he's there and he's, and he's good for it. Here you go. Here's some extra, give us some, uh, you know, give, give, give us some garden variety. Give us the, uh, give us the, you know, the, the, the holiday mix pack of uh, stormtroopers, <laughs> please, Steve. And he does it. Boom. And everybody's happy and everybody goes home. Mm -hmm. And that kind of pedigree, that kind of work ethic of, and just, being awesome, not just as a talent and performer, but as a person, that's a career. And that's what I always aim for. And I think is important things, not just like the, the gig or the dream job or the convention, but work from day to day. And that's what makes a career. Reminds me of Mel Blank, like legends like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that with Mel, that was at a time when there was like 10 people, you know, and Mel came out of radio, things like that. Um, and then you had these performers coming out uh, of the 80s with the Saturday morning and uh, afternoon cartoon boom, where we just need bodies that can do voices. Everybody, come in. They would order like three, what we would consider like three seasons worth of a cartoon. Yeah. And you would just crank those things out. Um, you know, it's not like that anymore. Now they go, uh, we'll give you six episodes. <laughs> well, that's, that, that's going okay. Uh, here, give me another six. Ooh, the numbers aren't great, you know. Wonderful show, Doc McStuffins. They just fought to get that a sixth season. They had to turn to the community who love watching the show, and it's a wonderful little show. Mm -hmm. Is it because it was on the bubble? It might have gotten canceled, you know. Um, and they got it. They got their sixth season, yay! But that's how it is. Whereas back in the '80s, when everything was a 
toy and a t-shirt. They would order just a ridiculous number of episodes right off the bat because they had time to fill. They realized they had these time slots in the afternoons and Saturday mornings, and we need, we need content for those time slots. And then they were able to sell advertising with it. And if you had a content that was an advertising for the advertisement that you would show between, you know, between episodes, perfect. A special time, special time. And there's a lot of people that had kind of voiceover boot camp that are still with us today that killed it in the eighties, you know, that they were part of that and they learned, learned really, really well. And they're still, you know, um, icons within the industry and working and still working. Let's shorten this one up. What's your favorite game? Mm, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> Top three. Top three. Um, it's still not fair. <laughs> no, not fair. Uh, but for a variety of reasons um, that I don't necessarily get to go into. Um, and some of them are not like the best games ever, but they came at particular times that made them important. And one is cheating because it's a series. Um, the Wing Commander games. So the Wing Commander series. Mm-hmm. Um, Full Throttle by Tim Schafer. And um, am I about to go back? I think I have to go back to the Tim Schafer well and say Grim Fandango. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Again, variety of reasons. You know, when those games came about, things like that, um, especially the Wing Commander games, they were just important because of their time. And they're all available. They're available at GOG.com. Okay, so these are quick, quick. Like, you have to just answer it right away. <laughs> Don't even think about it. Just go. Yep. Okay, favorite movie? Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh. Favorite actor? Ooh, hard one, huh? <laughs> again, again, not fair. <laughs> Living Dead, something like that. Um, it's cheap because I've been watching him for a very long time, and he was part of my inspiration for s- stuff and junk and... and it, Harrison Ford. <gasps> We're going to be well, besties good, at the end of this. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I, I am, I am more into for a variety of reasons other people, but like the person that I watched as a kid, and kind of went, I wouldn't mind doing that someday. And somebody whose work ethic and other things that I really loved and admired, he's from the Midwest. Harrison Ford. Nice. Okay, favorite companion in Mass Effect. The team I rolled with for like all three games. Rex and Garrus. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Favorite book? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know if I, uh, I don't know if I have one, which is a shame. Um, you know what? The one that stuck with me for a while, The Name of the Wind, the Patrick Rothfuss, the, the King Killer Chronicles. He's got two books out there right now. Oh, I've heard of that. I've heard it's really good. Yes. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely highly recommend it and it'd be great if everybody read it and then go bothers him to finish the third one. He's working on it and he's got more than enough people bothering him about it. Let the man work. And he's doing other brilliant, wonderful things too. And I'm amazed at I'm amazed at all the things he's doing. Uh but yeah, book three. Come on, Patrick, you got this, man. You got, you got this. How about favorite movie game genre? Usually people have a specific genre they like more. Okay. Um films. Hmm, that's that's not fair. I like <laughs> I like I like I like film. Um, but I would say probably not action because action to me means like eighties action or something like that. Um, yeah. But I like I like a good adventure film. I love the you know Fantastic Beasts, Raiders, things like that. Oh yeah. Uh, video games. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say the R- RPGs. RPGs, good choice. Good choice. <laughs> not, but, I'm telling but you, we're going to be like, besties by the end of this interview. Because <laughs> it's not just Mass Effect style stuff, but it's like Neverwinter Nights and the Baldur's Gate games, that <gasps> top-down, point-click stuff. Yeah. Uh, dogs or cats? Dogs. I got one just outside the box here. Aw. Yeah. Uh, favorite cartoon? Batman animated series. Those first two se- Those first two seasons are just... So Ugh. good. Nobody was doing anything like that at that time. Ugh. Do you remember? Okay, do you remember the, the the episode with Mr. Freeze? Oh my God, that one made me cry. Yep. yep. So yep. good. My other favorites from back then: uh, the Two Face introduction of Two Face, Part yes. One and Two, uh, with Richard Mole as uh, Harvey Dent and Two Face. Mm-hmm. He's genius on that show. So good. Uh, and then I would also say Feet of Clay, the introduction 
of two face of, excuse me, of clay face yeah oh my god oh my gosh brilliant 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 and heart-wrenching and yeah yeah so well done <laughs> favorite tv show mm, all time i don't know about all time one of the it's not like it's not interesting to say it but one of my favorite things i've watched recently for a variety of reasons uh luke cage Oh, yeah, how's that not interesting? That, that is interesting. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's like, oh, yeah, the the I think we said, said the other thing I really loved uh, recently, and I'm sad there's no more of it. I'm actually going to miss these characters and whatnot. Um, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Oh, my God. Yeah, I just saw that. It was so good. Oh, I haven't seen yeah. that. I had, oh, but... I had a copy of the book for years, and suddenly they did that. And I went, oh, but I'm not. Uh, all right. <laughs> it's I'm like... going to go back. It oh. MD, it's like it's like Harry Potter, but like grown up, and it's more <gasps> serious. Like it's so good, you have to see it. It's a show. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's it's on Amazon right now. I think. Oh my god, I have. To uh, it's, it's, it's Netflix. Netflix, and it was originally originally a novel, just a one shot novel. Um, yeah. And it's just, it's very British and cleverly <laughs> done and well performed. Uh, just, uh, <laughs> I, I'm gonna miss. I'm gonna miss that world. Yeah. Well, now I have to ask you, Stranger Norrell. <laughs> you know I have to ask you that question. I'm Team Strange. Yeah, that's strange. Yeah, yeah. strange. Yep. yep. Oh, there's teams? Uh, no, I have to watch this now. Okay, favorite band? <laughs> I love music, so that's not... <laughs> that's, uh, not that's not fair. Okay, right now, like what I'm listening because now before they got big, uh, the, the Black Keys. Oh yeah, good. Um, fits in the tantrums. Um, I also adore Two Door Cinema Club. Uh, historically though, uh, David Bowie, The Police. I mean, I could just li- uh, just a litany of everything, and I could also You're say cheating. That's more than one. <laughs> uh, Sh- Schumann, right? This is true. Schumann. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, uh, Debussy. Uh, you want to get Aww. classical too? Yeah. So, because I grew up, I played piano growing up. So, oh, uh, yeah, like eleven years of lessons. <laughs> so, <cool. laughs> so this one's will probably be hard too. Favorite song? What? If that's... <laughs> <laughs> what you doing, Denise? <laughs> okay. No, I think um, pastoral symphony, Beethoven. Oh. First one. <laughs> yeah, Aww. I love that. I, I I love that piece of music. Mine is Moonlight Sonata. Oh, yep. I could just yep. cry the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, mine isn't as classy as that. I'm I'm not gonna say it. Now you, now you have to say it. Yeah, you, you have, have to say, to say it. it. <laughs> it's awful, seriously. <laughs> well, I need to know who your se- favorite superhero is. Obviously. Oh man. You, no, there's no question. And this is comics, movies, doesn't matter. Captain America. That answers this. I was like, <laughs> no. Team Cap or Team Iron Man? Okay, okay. Cap. <laughs> team wow. Cap. No, Deadpool. Always Deadpool. <laughs> Deadpool. <laughs> yep. I, uh, my folks bought me a Captain America comic when I was learning to read. So I learned with Cap. And then when I started collecting, he was just like, I was just the one because I knew, I knew Cap. It's like, yeah, Cap. Okay. So I started reading Captain America. Well, now, Mr. Sci Fi Action Hero, <laughs> we don't want to keep you too long. But we do want to know if you're working on any projects that you'd like to talk about. Um, Mass Effect Andromeda coming <laughs> spring. Um, I'll actually be playing with uh, playing with them uh, later this week again. Um, nice. Oh, it's yeah, it's a treat. There's a there's a sad portion of me and some of the people that I'm working with who are going. Wait, we're almost done. Oh, oh no. Aww. I'm not going to hang out with you guys anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, part of me is going to be very sad. There, there could be more stuff, but like this moment, this time, like I said, I moved to California and less than three months later, suddenly I'm working on Mass Effect. You know, <sighs> wow. this kind of like little dream job thing, right? Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, always audiobooks. Uh, you can find anything I'm doing audiobook wise at. Uh, downpour.com uh, d-o-w-n-p-o-u-r.com that's with the fine folks at Blackstone Audio 
Um, of course, you can find things on Audible, things like that, but I just like to direct everybody to Blackstone first. Um, I've been working with them pretty much exclusively for a number of years now, and they keep sending me books, and I will keep recording them <laughs> uh, because they're wonderful. Um, I'm hoping to be able to talk about some upcoming audiobook stuff soon, but I can't say anything yet. Same thing about the video game stuff soon, but I can't say anything yet. <laughs> And uh, that's about it. Otherwise, you know, you got websites that I'm trying to update feverishly, uh, TomTaylorson.com. And then, of course, you can follow me on Twitter, at Taylorson. Well, thank you for being here. And you have official lifelong fans, I do believe. Absolutely. Thanks so much for talking to us. Welcome to, to, the, to the main protagonist club of Bioware, because <laughs> you're, you're going to be a big deal now. <laughs> Oh, it's sweet of you to say, especially before you've even heard the game yet. Oh yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> we hear your voice already, all right? I know no, that you're a sweetheart. Not, you know... You're so nice. Thank you so much. Oh, sweet to say. Thank you. No, okay. thank you for thank you for having me. Uh, like I said, the fans are a big part of this, and you guys have been wonderful since day one. So, if I can give back to you guys and keep in touch, you know, I think Frida and I are in a very fortunate position to be able to interact with you on, on this level. Then, oh then we'll, we'll do it. 